So mm. our next Wonderful. speaker this afternoon is uh, Piers Keen from the University College London and Moorfields Eye Hospital by the NHS Foundation Trust. If you are a reader of Nature Medicine, then over the last few years you may have noticed a number of very interesting papers on uh, machine learning in ophthalmology. And uh, Piers is a driving force behind this work. So there's a big collaboration between Moorfields and Google DeepMind with exciting results. And I'm sure we'll hear more about these uh, in a minute. So Piers is a medical doctor by training. He's now an associate professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology at the University College London and holds an appointment with the Moorfields Eye Hospital. He has won a number of awards in 2015, the Clinician Scientist Award from the National Institute of Health Research, and this year a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship. So we are very excited to welcome him here and to learn more about his research. Thank you for joining us, Piers. Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you, Carson. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to, to, to speak to you. And <clears throat> You know, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you about what I believe is the potential for <clears throat> machine learning to transform ophthalmology. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of hype around artificial intelligence and machine learning for for healthcare. But even despite all the hype, I think there is potential to do something quite exciting if we if we approach things in the right way. And one of the things that I'd like to try to to make a case for over the next hour is that ophthalmology is um, uh, is one of the medical specialties that's at the forefront of these transformation. And I think that there's a lot that we can, sh a lot of our experiences we can share with other medical specialties about not just the development <clears throat> of um, machine learning tools, but also the validation, the implementation and the adoption of these, syst uh, these uh, systems. <clears throat> Um, so Carson, um, you've already summarized uh, my background, but um, <clears throat> um, I have a dual appointment. So <clears throat> I'm a consultant ophthalmologist, so like a, a senior ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. And Moorfields Eye Hospital is the, the oldest eye hospital in the world and, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the largest eye hospitals in the world. Um, at Moorfields, I specialize in the treatment of retinal diseases. So um, conditions such as age-related macular degeneration, which is the commonest cause of blindness in Europe, <clears throat> and uh, diseases such as diabetic retinopathy, which is the commonest cause of blindness in working age populations in many countries in Europe and around the world. <clears throat> um, as you said, I'm also an associate professor at um, University College London <clears throat> at the Institute of Ophthalmology, and I lead a clinical research group <clears throat> at UCL, um, which is focused on AI-enabled healthcare. So we have a lot of work that we do with industry, so in particular with DeepMind and with Google, but we also have a lot of work that's separate from industry that's purely in an academic setting, and I'll tell you a little bit about both of those things um, during this meeting. And then the other thing is that I'm very privileged to, to be funded by UK Research and Innovation um, <clears throat> as a future leader. And this is a relatively new funding scheme and funding organization. And so it gives me the rare um, opportunity in that I'm, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a clinician, but essentially I have 80% of my time protected for research. And, and I think that that's the thing that has you know, really facilitated my ability to work with machine learning collaborators, um, because it, it would be very hard, and I, I'll bet some of the people listening would have experiences working with clinicians where it can be challenging, in particular when the clinicians are working 100% of their time in clinics and surgeries and, and other things. <clears throat> um, the other thing that I'll say is that I have acted as a consultant for DeepMind uh, and act as a consultant for um, pharmaceutical companies such as Roche and Genentech, and I'm involved in some uh, machine learning work with, the, with them as well. Um, but I, <clears throat> I think given that I'm gonna be talking a lot about the collaboration between Morefields and DeepMind and Google, 
it's important that I, I uh, volunteer that uh, financial uh, disclosure at the start. <clears throat> now, in terms of an overview of what I'm going to discuss over the next um, 45 minutes to an hour, <clears throat> Uh, probably more than 50%, maybe two thirds of the talk will be about the Morse fields um, DeepMind collaboration and some of the research outputs of that collaboration. Um, Carson, you mentioned some of the articles in Nature Medicine and I'm going to tell, talk about some of the results there. <clears throat> but then in the last third of the talk, <clears throat> I'm going to focus more on work that has, that has come out of that collaboration but is independent from DeepMind and from Google. And so, in effect, over the last five years, we have gone from, at Morefields, we have gone from knowing nothing about clinical AI to having a lot of uh, expertise and infrastructure to do clinical AI projects. And uh, one of these uh, is something that we call the Insight Health Data Research Hub. And I'll explain what that means. Another thing that I'm particularly excited about is called the ALTS Eye Study. And this is the idea of using the eye as the window to the brain, to the, sorry, to the rest of the body. <clears throat> and then lastly, I'm going to speculate a little bit about an emerging ecosystem for clinical AI. <clears throat> and in particular, I'm going to give some, some of my thoughts about the potential for automated deep learning and automated machine learning. And I think that I'll be very interested to see, to, to hear what people's comments and criticisms are on that, particularly given that this is a, uh, you know, an audience with machine learning experts. And so I may try and say some kind of controversial things to just promote, provoke a little bit of discussion, but I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, pushed back against in some of those uh, comments. <clears throat> so first of all, let me just set the scene, you know, what is the problem that we face in ophthalmology? Why do we need <clears throat> why do we need new technologies and innovation? And why do we need AI? <clears throat> or maybe this is just hype and AI is just another way for us to publish some papers and get some grants and things like that. Do we really need it? And so this figure is something that I love showing to clinical audiences, particularly when I'm speaking to um, to doctors from other medical specialties. So in 2017, ophthalmology overtook orthopedics as the number one busiest of all the medical specialties in terms of clinic appointments in the National Health Service in the UK. <clears throat> in fact, uh, <clears throat> nearly 10% of all clinic appointments um, in the NHS are for ophthalmology. <clears throat> that constitutes nearly 10 million appointments per year. And that's a number that's going like this. If you plot orthopedics over the last five years, it's like this. If you plot ophthalmology, it's like this. So in some senses, uh, and you know, maybe this is not an appropriate metaphor, but in some senses, we're drowning in the number of patients that we need to see. And if you go to an eye clinic, whether it's in London or Vienna or Boston or Beverly Hills, it's going to be very, very busy. I can guarantee you that. And it oftentimes standing room only in the waiting rooms. Now, the upshot of that is that there are some patients who are, you know, potentially losing sight and even potentially going blind because they cannot be seen and treated quickly enough by human experts. Um, for example, a retina specialist like me. <clears throat> now, this was particularly illustrated um, in January of, of uh, 2020, there, there was a lot of media attention in the UK about, because there was a very tragic case um, towards the end of 2019 that uh, I appreciate it's, an, it's, an, it's sort of anecdotal evidence, but, but nonetheless, it highlighted the challenges in the system that we face. And so this was a case of a woman in her 30s, I think she was 36 years old, um, in the south of England, and this woman was pregnant and she also had advanced glaucoma. And glaucoma is an eye disease where you have high pressure in the fluid of your eyes that damages your optic nerve, and it's a common cause of blindness. Now, what happened with this woman is that she needed to have urgent glaucoma surgery performed, and for whatever reason and for whatever chain of events, there was delays in her getting the surgery, and she lost her sight completely. She went blind. Now, I cannot think of a more tragic scenario 
then a young mother who has lost her sight, and perhaps it could have been prevented if the intervention had been done in a timely fashion. And so I believe, as I say, and it's it's not perhaps not a surprise, I believe that you know the latest advances in machine learning can at least begin to address some of these problems that we face. Uh, <clears throat> so essentially, this this is the reason why. Um, I initiated this collaboration between Moorfields Eye Hospital and uh, the artificial intelligence company DeepMind. Now, I should I should highlight to people in this audience, um, particularly if you're asking me any very detailed technical questions later, is that I I'm coming at this from the background of a of a clinician. I don't have any um, formal machine learning or data science or computer science training or anything like that. And so I contacted DeepMind just because I knew that there were people going, um, you know, going blind because they couldn't be seen and treated quickly enough. I knew that there was massive advances taking place um, in the machine learning community over the last five, seven, ten years or so, in particular with regard to deep learning. And I knew that we had huge data sets uh, of ophthalmic images, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about those. And and so. I was looking around for collaborators, um, you know, who had deep learning expertise. And so initially I was looking for some academic collaborators um, back in sort of 2014, 2015. And I didn't really find anybody that was, um, was particularly interested at, at that time, although I have subsequently. And, and so actually what happened was I was reading, I was reading a profile about, Wire, uh, about DeepMind in Wired magazine. In, in July of 2015, and you know, I had known about DeepMind because I've you know seen the media attention when they had been acquired by Google. But what really resonated with me was that two of the three uh, founders of DeepMind <clears throat> are alumni of UCL, and which is of course the university affiliated with Moorfields, and two of the three of the founders are from London. And of course, the other thing was that their headquarters are based in, in the King's Cross area of London. And for those of you who know London, that's, that's only two stops away from Moorfields on the Northern Line on, on the London Underground. So it's like a very, it's a very short distance between the hospitals. And so we, um, I approached them and uh, Moorfields then sort, signed a formal research collaboration agreement in July of 2016 with them. And essentially, what we wanted to do <clears throat> is um, develop a deep learning system that could look at these eye scans, these scans of the, the, the neural tissue at the back of the eye, which is called the retina. And these eye scans are called OCT scans or optical coherence tomography scans. And OCT is, is kind of like an ultrasound, but it measures light waves instead of sound waves. And in doing so, it gives very high resolution um, three-dimensional images of tissue. So the, the axial resolution of an OCT scan is approximately five micrometers. So if you think about it, that's an order of magnitude um, higher resolution than a CT scan or an MRI scan. And OCT has become the dominant imaging modality in ophthalmology. In fact, we do more OCT scans than all other ophthalmic imaging combined. <clears throat> and we do more than a thousand OCT scans per day at Moorfields. So, so it seemed to me that this was uh, a nice overlap between a pressing patient need and a situation where we had large amounts of data that could uh, be amenable to machine learning. <clears throat> so the research collaboration agreement actually, I mean, it was signed in the middle of 2016, but it had actually begun when I had read the article in Wired in July 2015. And in the article, the part of it described um, you know, one of the co-founders of DeepMind is Mustafa Suleiman, who is uh, uh, leading their applied division. And he said, you know, I'm interested in applying AI to healthcare, to climate change, to energy consumption, <clears throat> and, you know, to making the world a better place. And so I, he was the person that I contacted to initiate this collaboration. And the exciting thing for me was that, you know, um, just a few days after I, I sent him a message, I found myself sitting in his office and, you know, telling him about the potential of this of this collaboration. But I remember going in and saying, <clears throat> you know, we've got we've got so many patients. We're doing thousands of scans per day or per week. You know, people are going blind. And he said to me, well, 
how many OCT scans do you have in total? And I didn't really have an answer to that. And he said, you know, what are the different systems? What's the quality of the scans? What proportion of the scans do you have labels for? You say that diabetes is a common cause of blindness, but how many of the scans are from diabetic patients? What are the file formats? Are they proprietary file formats? Are they open source file formats? You know, um, all of these questions. And to be honest, if I look back now, I feel embarrassed because I was so clueless. I didn't really have any answers to the questions that he was asking me. And he asked me, equally important, he asked, well, what are the ethical and the governance requirements? <clears throat> because, you know, this would involve sharing, you know, these scans with the company that's owned by Google from, from the NHS. And again, this was a this was a collaboration. I just knew that there was this urgent clinical need, and this technology could address it. But I didn't know all that would go into such a project. And so, actually, it took a lot of teamwork um, <clears throat> behind the scenes at Morefields to begin to figure out at least some of the answers to those questions. And an interesting thing that I would say, actually, that I've observed over the last five years, is that. <clears throat> You know, DeepMind and Google are very commonly approached by clinicians who are who are in a similar situation to me, and they have they know that they've got some big data sets, they know that they've got a pressing clinical problem, but in the meeting with them, um, you know, DeepMind or Google or sometimes me would say to them, okay, well, can you answer some specific questions about the data set? And they usually can't, and they at the end of the meeting they say, okay we'll find out the answers to those questions and we'll get back to you in about a week's time or two weeks time with all the answers and then we'll proceed. Nine times out of 10, you never hear from them again because they find it very challenging to get the answers to those questions. <clears throat> so when we, I think we were good because I think we were kind of tenacious and when we did answer all those questions, <clears throat> we could put in place a data sharing agreement and we ended up sharing back in 2016 about 1.2 million anonymized historical OCT scans with DeepMind. And that began this, this collaboration. <clears throat> now, the thing is that, um, you know, this, this is a, a sensitive and appropriately sensitive area because this is, like I said already, this is sharing NHS data in the UK with a company that's owned by, owned by Google and um, a multinational tech company. And so from the start, we wanted to, to be as transparent about what we were doing as possible and to make sure that we did everything right um, or, or do our very best to be cautious and careful and respectful of the use of people's data. So from the start, we put a section of um, the Moorfields website, which is dedicated to the collaboration and um, it's still there now and you can, you can go and have a look at that. And there's videos and there's FAQs and there's things like, <clears throat> you know, um, if you want to opt out of this research, you know, here's the email ad address of our information governance officer, um, you know, giving as much information and being as transparent as we can. If you go to the waiting areas in Moorfields, <clears throat> you can see that we've got um, sort of flat screen TVs to, you know, try and keep people happy while they're waiting you know, well, they have long waits for their appointments sometimes. And one of the things we do is we have a, we have screen savers that come up uh, intermittently. And one of the screen savers is about the collaboration. And it tells people what we're doing. And it, it uh, points to people to where they can learn more about uh, the work that we're doing. <clears throat> the other thing that we did was that before we had done any sort of experiments whatsoever, we published our protocol in uh, open source uh, machine learning or open source uh, uh, peer reviewed publication. And then, <clears throat> then we could finally sort of get to the to um, the science and it was very exciting for us then in August 2018, Karsten, as you mentioned already, to publish our work in the journal Nature Medicine. You can see that there's more than 30 different co authors here. And this reflects the fact that we had uh, experts from UCL, uh, experts from Moorfields, and experts from DeepMind. And it, the key point is that this wasn't just giving them the data and then, then coming back two years later with a publication. This was very much a research collaboration. 
um, from the very start. And I don't think it would have been possible if any of the three groups were not contributing. Now, it was also um, very exciting for us because um, it was published on the cover of Nature Medicine. And of course, this is AI, so there's a lot of hype. And it was very exciting that it got global media attention. Now, you know, it's thrilling, I think, to, it's, it, for me, it's, it's, it's a thrill to see your work getting widespread attention. It's also a little bit awkward, um, because the fact of the matter is that we have not saved the sight of millions of people yet. And in fact, what we've published here in Nature Medicine is a, is a proof of concept that a machine learning algorithm can do this. And in fact, if you were to email me after this talk and say, can I come to Moorfields and see it in action? You, you wouldn't be able to because it's not in action yet. We're not using it in the real world yet. And what I've come to learn in the last few years is that going from the research publication or the conference presentation to implementation in real life is really, really hard. And in some ways doing the first step is kind of the easy step. And before this, I always presumed that the hard part was publishing the paper and that's not the case. So, um, in any event, what we did was we created, um, uh, you know, a, a, a deep learning framework that consisted of two neural networks. The first neural network was a segmentation network. We would feed in the raw um, OCT volume, and we trained it with about 900 manually segmented uh, OCT volumes, and that allowed it to create this intermediate representation that could be fed into a classification network that we trained with about 15,000 labels. And ultimately, it would give a classification output such as urgent referral, semi-urgent referral, or a diagnose um, up to 10 different uh, retinal diseases. So anything that you would expect an ophthalmologist to be able to look at and see on an OCT scan. Now, we, we created the tissue segmentation map as an intermediate representation for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of the nice byproducts of that is that it gives some, some clinical interpretability to the model. And also it gives a range of kind of interesting quantitative metrics for clinicians when they're, they're treating these patients. So this is just an example um, <clears throat> of the uh, video of the model running. And so at the bottom row, you can see an OCT volume. And the bottom right, you can see the figure legend of about probably about 10 or 15 different uh, anatomic parameters that are segmented. This is a patient with diabetes, this patient in his 40s, got poorly controlled diabetes. And you don't have to be an ophthalmologist to see that the, the retina is very swollen. It's waterlogged. This is called retinal edema. <clears throat> and in the top row, you can see referral suggestion is semi-urgent referral and diagnosis probability macular retinal edema 98.5%. Now, <clears throat> we wanted to evaluate the performance of the model. Um, so we got 1,000 new patients that had presented to Morefields that had had a macular OCT scan done at presentation. And let me tell you, this was a retrospective evaluation. So this wasn't a prospective clinical trial. And that's an important distinction in terms of validation of these systems. Um, <clears throat> and essentially, we ran the algorithm on those 1,000 cases, and we looked as a primary outcome at the errors on the referral decision. And what we found was here that it had about a 5.5% error rate on the referral decision. This is the triage decision, because remember, our use case is not replacing the retina specialist. Our use case is targeting those people with sight threatening disease to get them in front of a retinal specialist who can actually make the diagnosis and give the treatment. Now, we wanted to benchmark the performance against human experts. So we got eight human experts and experts one to four are uh, senior retinal specialists at Moorefields, and experts five to eight are optometrists at Moorefields, who have a little bit less experience um, in looking at these scans. <clears throat> we locked them in a room and said, look at all 1,000 scans and give your triage decision, uh, your referral decision, and give your diagnosis and all of those things. And we looked at their errors, and the gold standard that we took was when the patients had seen a retinal specialist and they had not just had an OCT scan, but they had um, you know, fluorescein angiography and a range of other tests, 
and then they were treated and followed up for a six month time period. And that was our reference standard. Now, um, how did the human experts do? Well, what we saw was that the algorithm did better than all eight human experts, except for experts one and two, when it, it, was, it was better, but it wasn't statistically significantly uh, better. Now, one thing that I've learned over the last five years is that whenever you see the hype around AI you, and you see superhuman performance or a headline like beats the best doctors, when you dig into the details, you often find that the do doctors are, do are not doing a task that they do in their day-to-day -day life, or they're doing a task with one arm tied behind their back. And it's not a fair comparison with the real world. And indeed, this is not a fair comparison because in the real world, the human experts would never make a triage decision based on an OCT scan alone. They would know the visual acuity of the patient. They would ha probably have a retinal photograph and they might have, they would likely have some history, um, some details of the patient. <clears throat> now, to make it fairer and to simulate that, we repeated the experiment with the human experts and we gave them all of that additional information. We'll lock them in a room again and ask them to, to to reanalyze the scans, but in a, a different order and after a time period. And it wasn't a surprise to us then <clears throat> that the human experts, that, Im that improved the performance of all the human experts. And it got to the point where expert number one was able to equal the algorithm using the OCT scan alone. And let me tell you, experts number one and two are world famous uh, ophthalmologists who have more than 20 years of experience uh, each. Now, interestingly, um, the algorithm did as well as it did with just the OCT alone, but adding that additional information didn't really improve the performance of the algorithm significantly. So what did it get wrong? <clears throat> well, I'm not gonna go into the confusion matrices here, but what um, the BBC picked up on was that AI did not miss a single urgent case. Now, <clears throat> from my perspective, what was interesting is that when I looked at the expert number one, the human expert number one, and saw that they had a 5.5% error rate, well, what did they get wrong considering that they are one of the world's leading experts? Well, actually, the cases that they got wrong were ambiguous cases. And in actual fact, when we looked post hoc, maybe our human experts label was correct and our reference standard was incorrect with the benefit of hindsight. But of course we can't change it after the fact. Now, interestingly, when we looked at the errors that the algorithm made, that was also the case. So a lot of its errors were not really errors when we looked at it uh, after the fact. <clears throat> now, where are we going with this? Well, at the moment, um, we're trying to bridge what I call the AI chasm. And <clears throat> this is a term that I, I read, I read an article in TechCrunch a couple of years ago, and it was talking about this in the in the tech world. And this is the idea that, you know, if you're a startup, it's very, it's sort of easy potentially to do a cool demo of a machine learning system, but it's a very different thing to have a scalable deployment and meaningful human AI interactions, you know, at, at a large scale. <clears throat> and if it's hard in the tech world, I think it's extremely hard in healthcare. To, to bridge that chasm. And so that's what we've been trying to do since we published the paper in 2018. So what are the different ways you need to do that? Well, <clears throat> one of the things is working on the technical maturity of the algorithm. And you know, as a non-machine learning expert, I, I think it's fair to say that most doctors don't realize that the piece of experimental code that is reported in a, in a research paper is not really something that can be deployed at scale in a piece of software around the world. And so the team at Google have been working to essentially rewrite the algorithm so that it can, it can run with a fraction of the computing, uh, computing power in a fraction of the time and make it into a, a cloud-based API. And the cool thing was that we did a live demo of that uh, in uh, Wired Health in March 2019. <clears throat> and we actually got a patient with AMD, we got their scan, and live on stage, we sent it to the cloud, we ran the algorithm on it, we logged in with a different laptop and showed the algorithm giving an output. And so that was that was exciting. 
um, uh, but also a little bit risky because it would have been quite embarrassing if we had if we had screwed that up. Um, the other thing that I've I think it's important to emphasize is the need for better clinical validation. And um, this is a paper that came out in the Lancet Digital Health that I'm a co-author on in September 2019, and is a systematic review and meta-analysis of um, <clears throat> essentially deep learning papers in medical imaging. Um, and really the, the take home message is that the quality of those papers is very, is very, very poor in terms of clinical validation standards. And only a tiny percentage of papers are, are of a good clinical standard. And so we're very aware <clears throat> of this. And so we've been taking, I think, a very measured approach to um, you know, validating our algorithm. And so one of the things we've been doing now is trying to validate it in OCT scans taken from, from eye clinics all around the world. So we want to make sure that an algorithm that we've developed in London works as well in Ghana or Brazil or the US or you know, uh, Asia or any other countries around the world. And it turns out that there's lots of complexities to that. <clears throat> Now, the other thing with implementation is that you, you know, it's not enough just to have an AI system or a machine learning system in isolation. It has to be able to fit into pathways. There has to be um, you know, uh, billing within the healthcare system to be able to, to support the, uh, the machine learning system. And so Morefields, where I'm a consultant, is building a new hospital <clears throat> um, in King's Cross in London uh, beginning in 2021 and we're trying to anticipate now what flexibility we'll need in our clinical pathways so we can take advantage of these you know uh, breakthroughs in machine learning technology as they come through the other thing is that we're increasingly seeing oct being used in the community in community optometry settings um, and so <clears throat> we're trying to think about how we can link the community uh, optometry clinics with the hospital system and then put a machine learning system on top of that uh, and of course that's the considerable challenges associated with that and then there are in fact OCT uh, devices which are being built for home use and a number of companies are in advanced stage in developing those so ultimately we see a chance with this technology to bring world-class expertise into the community and into people's homes now, just to say that was what that was the main thing I wanted to talk about. I'm going to tell you a little bit more briefly um, about the, the follow up study from the Moorfields Deep Mind collaboration. And then lastly, I'll tell you much more quickly about some of the other studies that we're doing. But just to say, we're really proud that our work has been patient centered from the start. This is a patient of mine called Elaine Mana uh, uh, at Moorfields. And Elaine uh, lost her sight from wet macular degeneration. Uh, more than 10 years ago before there was any good treatments. And in 2012, she started to lose her sight in her good eye and she got an urgent appointment to see, uh, see an ophthalmologist, but the appointment was like six weeks later. And imagine if you're a situation where you're at home and you're losing sight in your good eye and you're told that there's a treatment now available, but you need to wait six weeks for it. Well, if that was my mother, I would want her to be seen and treated within six days and not within six weeks. And so we, we, that, was, it was, that was the motivation for the first collaboration I've just told, about, told you about, but it also got us thinking about something else, which is this idea that patients with eye diseases are really worried about their good eye being affected. And so they may be coping when they've lost sight in one eye, but if their good eye is affected, that's when they really get stressed about it. And so we began to think, could we use machine learning to predict ahead of time the involvement of the good eye, relying on the fact that if patients are being treated for their first eye, they typically would have scans done on both eyes for a period of time. So essentially it means that, you know, um, we have a situation where we have lots of normal data um, or data before, a, you know, catastrophic quick ocular event happens that we could use to do a prediction task uh, with deep learning. So 
if we could do that, then maybe we can protect the good eye with kind of novel treatments. And maybe that means we stop the event from happening or we can mitigate its effects once it does happen. So in May 2020, we published a second paper in um, Nature Medicine. And just to highlight that the joint first author on this paper is a PhD student of mine who's uh, at UCL is an optometrist called Rina Chopra, and really was um, the brains behind uh, a lot of uh, this paper <clears throat> with the amazing team at, at DeepMind and Google and UCL and, and others. Um, so what we did with this was the idea, the setup was uh, that you have patients with wet AMD, exudative AMD in their first eye, they're receiving injections into this eye and having regular follow-up visits. And at the same time, they're having scans done in their first eye. Now, we created uh, essentially a prediction model that was an ensemble um, with, no with number five here, which is an end-to-end -end prediction model based just on the, the raw um, OCT scans, plus also in number three, two, three, and four here, a prediction model that uh, leverages the segmentation outputs from, from the system. Put them together in an ensemble, and then essentially the output of the model was predicting what we called imminent conversion, which was development of wet AMD within six months, the site-threatening form of the disease. Now, I'm going to go through this quickly, but just to say that in terms of our data set, um, it was big by AMD terms, but maybe small by machine learning terms. It was about 96,000 um, OCT volume scans. And in our test set, we had about 5,000 scans. And we wanted to predict imminent conversion. Now, the main figure from the paper really is this one. <clears throat> the main, and, you know, essentially we've got the blue curve and we've got the orange curve and the, or the orange curve looks better than the, the blue curve, but actually the blue curve is the one that's clinically meaningful. That's actually predicting the conversion point. And for that, we had an AUC of 0 0.745. And of course, that's not spectacular um, when you compare it to the sort of 0 0.99 AUCs that you see in a lot of papers. But the fact is that the AUC is not clin clinically meaningful. Really what you have to do, is, as you all know, is select operating points on that ROC curve to determine your sensitivities and specificities, and, and those are the clinically meaningful metrics. And so we, we chose a, what we call a liberal operating point, and then more importantly, a conservative operating point. So our intended use case for this was that if we could predict imminent conversion, then maybe these patients would be able to get a treatment such as an injection into their eye to prevent conversion. Now for that use case, we wanted to optimize for specificity because we didn't want to have, um, you know, we didn't want to be injecting people false positives, essentially. We don't want to be giving them an invasive treatment if they're not going to convert. So in that scenario, we had a, with a 90% specificity, we had about a 35% sensitivity. So we're not so much worried about the false negatives because we're monitoring those patients pretty regularly anyhow. Now, the other thing was that we wanted to benchmark it against human performance. And this was actually not a task that human experts had ever, had, had ever done before. And they did better than we expected. But the fact is that they were very variable. Um, you know, as you would expect compared to uh, a machine learning algorithm. Just to highlight the subgroup analysis, and, and, and this is mainly for an ophthalmic audience, but the key point is that of the 5,000 OCT scans in the test set, the only about 4% of them actually developed um, uh, wet AMD within that six month time period, which sort of highlights the challenge of the task that we set ourselves. I'll just uh, skip ahead through some of those. Even this is just to show that even in the highest risk group, it was only 6.7% developed uh, imminent conversion. So where I think this is going is, the reason that I'm excited about this is because in 2021, we would like to use, we would like to begin a clinical trial which uses this algorithm or some improved version of this algorithm <clears throat> to identify high risk patients for fellow eye conversion to recruit them into a trial. Now, I think that that's going to be a very powerful use case for machine learning because it mitigates against a lot of the, 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 the issues with deep learning in terms of its brittleness, its fragility, et cetera, 
when it encounters data that is different from what it's been trained on. So in a clinical trial setting, we can control what type of OCT device, we can control the quality of the images, and we have a lot of other controls that sort of allow us to maximize the likelihood of getting a meaningful answer from the system. And so I think that's one of the first use cases that we're going to see in the real world in the near future. Now, I know that I've talked a little bit too long on some of the things, and we've got about 15 minutes left, but uh, in, to include some questions. But um, just in the next, um, you know, uh, five to seven minutes, I just want to tell you about some of our other spin-off uh, projects and what building from what we've learned from all of this work that we've done with DeepMind and with Google. So the first thing is at Moorefields, we've 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 come to realize in a granular form exactly how much imaging data that we're generating, and so just from just from one or two different vendors, we're generating about 1.2 million ophthalmic images per year at Moorefields, and we've greatly expanded our research database now, and we've also moved it to the cloud. So we have a Moorefields Research Cloud. And essentially, we've got a big query, query database, and we've got you know a lot of these scans um, in the cloud. And uh, one of the exciting things that we're doing then is that we've got funding at the end of 2019 from Health Data Research UK to share all that we've learned about the aggregation and curation of ophthalmic data with other NHS trusts. And so the idea would be to try and create a national bioresource for ophthalmic data. And then this bioresource would be available to both industry and academia all around the world to get access to this data to hopefully lead to, to patient uh, benefit in the future. So that's something maybe, um, you know, I'd love to talk about at some, uh, some point in the future. The other thing that I'd like to, to talk about our learnings is um, you know, we have learned a lot about how to approach the ethics and the governance of um, using cl uh, clinical data. That has allowed us to do a spin-off project, which involves using the eye as a window to the rest of the body. So this is, of course, an, an old idea. Um, but in, you know, since about 2018, uh, you know, we've, we've come to learn that uh, using deep learning, you can potentially see a lot more things looking at retinal photographs. So with this image, we can say this is a woman just from deep learning. And no, no retina specialist or no ophthalmologist can do that very well. We can say she's 58 years old. She's not a smoker. She's not diabetic. Her body mass index is around 25 and her blood pressure is 150 over 85 approximately. Now, this is kind of mind-blowing for ophthalmologists that this is possible. Now, if you're skeptical, you may say, well, you know, what's the point? You know, it's easy, you know, there are easier ways to tell if it's a man or a woman or the age of a patient than applying machine learning to a retinal photograph or to measure someone's blood pressure. You just put a blood pressure cuff, off, a cuff on and you measure it. But I think what we've come to learn is that if we can get the appropriate data sets and apply the appropriate expertise to them, maybe we can uncover some interesting stuff. And so one of the things we've done using our experience now around governance is we've linked about 3 million OCT scans plus 3 million paired retinal photographs with a national database in the UK called Hospital Episode Statistics. And it took us about two and a half years to get the permissions for this. And essentially that means that we know every patient who's had a retinal scan at Moorefields that has gone on to develop a heart attack or has gone on to develop any kind of dementia or a range of other diseases. And in fact, the numbers we have are two to three orders of magnitude bigger than a lot of other cohort studies like UK Biobank study, for example. Now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this, this was featured in The Economist in uh, December, 2019. And interestingly, this was featured at a point where we didn't have, and we still don't have actually any like break, breakthrough results from this work because we've just started it. But the emphasis in the article in The Economist, and this is a tweet from the person who wrote it, Hal Hodson, was our attention to detail around the use of health data and the governance of health data. And this is what has allowed us to, you know, to get to this point. And then lastly, just in my last uh, two or three minutes, 
I just want to say some interesting, maybe stimulate some conversation, which is that I feel that there could be an emerging ecosystem for clinical AI. And so I think that much of our work has been with uh, industry for the last five years. In the last two or three years, we're developing really good links with uh, academia. But I'm really interested in actual healthcare professionals beginning to explore machine learning, and particularly those without a specialized expertise. And so this is inspired by an article I read in the New York Times in 2017 about automated deep learning platforms that are now available from um, you know, many uh, companies. And these are essentially drag and drop interfaces for the most part that allow people without uh, you know, coding experience to develop uh, a deep learning classifier. You know, if you've got a thousand pictures of cats and a thousand pictures of dogs, you can upload them and you can develop a model to be able to distinguish between the two. So we got excited about this and we got some uh, five publicly available medical image data sets, skin lesions, chest x-rays, retinal photographs, OCTs, and essentially members of my research group without coding experience were able to tr train classifiers and get pretty good results um, within days. And that was tremendously exciting for us, particularly because we've been kind of like looking in awe at some of our machine learning collaborators over the last few, few years and kind of um, jealous of their capabilities in some sense. Now we published this in the Lancet Digital Health in September 2019. And one of my heroes, Eric Topol said, this will be regarded as a classic paper when AI becomes part of every medical school curriculum. Because whatever you think about whether this is actually useful in the real world, this is certainly, I think, a good tool for clinicians to be able to learn about how, how to do these things and what, what are the mistakes you can make and where you need to be careful um, in a variety of ways. Now, an interesting thing that I can't help telling you is that the editor of the Lancet Digital Health said this in the revision process. She said, one point that we hope is that you will be, that you'll be able to address is to emphasize that these tools will not necessarily replace AI experts. Now, this made me smile because for the last five years, every time I give a talk to doctors, people say, you know, is this going to replace us? And I'm excited about the technology, but I'm realistic. So I don't think that healthcare is going to be solved in the next five years. And I don't think that artificial general intelligence is going to be solved in the next five years. So I think that there's always going to be work for AI experts, at least for the foreseeable future, and the same for doctors. So why am I excited about this? I think it could be a bicycle for the mind. And this is an advertisement that I love from August 1980 about um, the Apple II computer. And, and Steve Jobs said, personal computers can be like a bicycle for the mind. Now, what's interesting is when you read this, you forget actually that back in the 70s, the idea of a personal computer was, was not widely accepted. So you had these famous quotes like from uh, the head of digital uh, corporation saying, there's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. You like essentially at the time, you know, IBM made mainframe computers, digital made mini computers, and they were used by the military and they're used by universities. Um, but they, you know, they said, well, why would anybody want a personal computer in their home? They can't really do very much. They're very limited. But actually, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and others had the vision that if you give these things, even if they're crude, people will come up with lots and lots of applications. And I think the same could happen as we begin to automate some of the machine learning tools that, that we begin to have. So when I'm talking to clinicians, I say, if not you, then who? So I say, if you're interested, go and download some, download some public image data sets and uh, play around with these things. Now, of course, before the audience start throwing things at me, let me say, um, just there's lots of caveats. So the first thing I say to clinicians is don't use images from your own institution unless you have the appropriate approvals. And the second thing is that I say is nobody is suggesting that these could be used for direct patient care anytime soon. Because if we have to be cautious about the clinical validation of bespoke state-of-the-art machine learning models, we need to be even more cautious if it was an automated system. 
but I think that this will be exciting because I think clinical researchers can can look can uh, look for a range of ideas, begin to dip their toe in the water, and find some interesting things, do a proof of concept, and then if there's potential, work with real experts to be able to actually develop better systems. And Eddie Corat is the clinician for my my uh, team that is leading that work. My last two slides, just to say, you know, I think ophthalmology is, um, you know, there's a real potential to reinvent the eye examination for the 21st century uh, using machine learning. Um, and if you'd like to read a little bit more about it, I've, there's a short essay that I wrote with one of my heroes, Eric Topol, in The Lancet in December 2019. And you know, we need to move towards implementation, AI-assisted clinical trials, AI-assisted scientific discovery, and I think democratization and industrialization of the technology. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, it, this is my email address. If anybody wants to get in touch, I, I always try to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Piers, for this excellent talk. That explained like the realities of, of bringing mm -hmm. machine learning to relevant clinical problems and to the, to the clinic. It was very exciting for us. So let me see whether there are uh, raised hands already. Yes, Suki from the network, Suki Lee has a question. Please go ahead. Hello, hi Piers. Uh, thank you, you just gave a very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is about your model evaluation. So you said, uh, as you mentioned, like, uh, not all the true uh, labels are actually true. So there are some mistakes. So how do you uh, measure and uh, address this problem? Um, so I think one of, I think there's no easy answer. I okay. think um, I think that what I've learned is that for deep learning projects with, with medical images, a site, the major blocker is the governance and the permissions, but the other major blocker is you need to have meticulous attention to detail for labeling the data. And you have to have a proper strategy and protocol in place to label the data. So typically we would get automated labels from the electronic health record but those are gonna be garbage a lot of the time. We would actually manually review all of the labels and we would typically at least have two graders, one of whom is a junior grader, one of whom is a senior grader. They would have a protocol that, that determines and then in areas where they have discrepancy, we would have some other, pro other person who adjudicates. So you have to have a systematic approach to labeling those. And even with that approach in place, oftentimes the gold standard that you have is going to be still ambiguous. And this is just a challenge for the field. Yeah. So do you also take a, like a consistent protocol for this kind of labeling? Some, what kind of protocol? Uh, consistent, like for all the data you have. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, we, like I get, I, I get my group to prepare protocols where they describe um, two or three typical cases of each label. They, per, they uh, identify edge cases for each label. Um, we also look at the uh, reproducibility uh, of our labels to see if we're consistent with each other. Um, it takes a lot of attention to detail to get that right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you <laughs> do you have an estimate of how transferable to other populations outside the UK these models are? Um, I mean, that's the million dollar question. It's a, it's about the generalizability of machine learning models. So I, I don't even really know how well it generalizes within the UK yet. And we have to do the studies. So our big thing that we're interested in is um, will the model generalize from a hospital-based setting within the UK to a community setting where the disease prevalence is very different? And then will it generalize to other countries? And we, we are doing, I, I briefly mentioned it, but we're doing a global validation study where we're trying to test that 
if we have a patient that you know an African patient with diabetes who comes in London, will it will it work as well if that if we if the same patient was in Ghana, for example? And I hope that we'll have some results of that um, in the in the next year. I feel quietly confident that we'll do okay because of the fact that London has a very diverse population in terms of ethnic group and in terms of disease severity, but we need to prove it. And until we prove it, we cannot assume it will generalize. Now I'm trying again. Leslie, does it work now? Yes, I, I you uh, are muted, please. Did uh, any of my question go through? No, not at all. Oh, so okay. Not on my side, at least. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I wanted to say thank you for your talk. It was very interesting to hear this all from your perspective. Um, my question is about Uh, when you mentioned that you had substantial hurdles to getting access and approval to work with the data, you mentioned that you were also very intentional on making your efforts known to patients by having it on the website and having um, information available in your office. And I was curious if you were aware of any patient reactions to yeah. your work, if, if there were any. Yeah. Um, so the patients... The patients, to my knowledge, have been unanimously supportive of the work. Um, one of the things that I didn't say is that when we launched the, when we announced the work, we also brought we 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 brought the support of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, plus all the major eye disease charities, um, plus our patient groups, and we've had a number of talks um, to the public. Um, and to patient groups where I've talked about it. And so when I spoke to the Macular Society, which is the main disease charity in the UK for macular degeneration, I spoke to more than 200 patients on one occasion. And uh, you know, at the end of my talk, the, the, the chief executive said, um, you know, what do people feel about this? Because this is sharing your anonymized OCT scans with Google. And, and, and she said, hands up those people in the room who would be happy for this um, to happen. And every single person in the room put up their hand, except for one person. And uh, the chief executive asked her, you know, why would, what's your concern? And she said, I'd be happy as long as my scans are anonymized. Uh, and of course, we, we, we do anonymize the scans. Um, and so I think that the patients, in my experience, have been very, very supportive. I think that there are members of the public who I think quite uh, rightly ask some questions around uh, sharing of NHS data with a company like Google and making sure that people's privacy is respected and, and you know, a range of other questions around that. And I, if I was in the same position, I would, I would ask the same questions. That's great, thank you. Thank you. And thank you from all of us, peers. We sent you a round of virtual applause for this excellent talk. I hope it's the start of a or beginning of a dialogue between us and you. So this this was wonderful. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Kirsten. You're welcome.